The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. The Democracy Forum brings you another not-to-be-missed webinar, The United Nations, Retaining Relevance in a Conflict-Ridden World. Since its official formation in October 1945, the United Nations has played a key role in global conflict prevention through diplomacy and mediation. But in a rapidly shifting geopolitical landscape, how does the future look for the UN as a peacekeeping force? With conflicts proliferating across the world, including those in Ukraine, Gaza and Sudan, is the UN's role in crisis. What are the prospects for reform or expansion of the Security Council to allow greater geographical inclusivity? And, given the organization's structural limitations, how should we manage expectations of what it can realistically achieve? To consider these and related issues, tune into our latest debate, bringing your questions and comments. Hello and welcome. I am Humphrey Hawksley, your host for this fascinating and highly topical democracy forum debate, the United Nations retaining relevance in a conflict-ridden world. We hear so much about paralysis in the UN Security Council, the supposed arbiter of international law, caused when one of the five permanent members casts a veto under a charter drawn up 80 years ago. We hear of increasing influence within the 193 members of the UN General Assembly, a de facto world parliament without teeth. And then bubbling under that radar, the UN is currently running some dozen peacekeeping missions around the world that stopped conflict spreading. So not complete paralysis, but reform, yes, badly needed. Everyone agrees that. But then according to the specialist journal Security Council report, that would require a change to that ancient charter by two-thirds of the members of the General Assembly, followed by ratification of two-thirds of UN members' legislatures, including the legislatures of five permanent members of the Security Council. That is not going to happen anytime soon. So then what? To debate and drill down, we have a Democracy Forum panel of experts, Richard Kaplan, Joel Ung, Alina Leon, and Maya Ungar. Democracy Forum Chair, Member of British Parliament, and a veteran of United Nations issues, will be listening to the arguments and sum up at the end. Having said that, he's actually in a parliamentary special commission session at the moment, so may have to dip in and out. But he's going to tell us whether we've nailed it or not nailed it. And as always, the Democracy Forum president, Lord Charles Bruce, will clarify the complex tapestry that is the United Nations and lay out the canvas for our debate. Lord Bruce, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the first Democracy Forum webinar of 2024. In opening a new season of forum activities, I'd like to thank the team at TDF for focusing on an issue which has shadowed many of the topics discussed by our panels last year, the purpose and relevance of the United Nations in an increasingly vociferous and systemically hazardous world. I'm delighted that we've been able to invite such an authoritative team of panelists to bring their perspectives to bear on such an important subject today. And I'd like to thank Humphrey Hawksley for resuming his role as moderator. 
presenting his annual report on the United Nations Organization for 2023, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warned not only that the world is becoming unhinged, but international institutions have not kept pace and may face be becoming part of the problem rather than the solution. It's reform or rupture, he said. The world has changed. Our institutions have not. While fundamental reform of the United Nations remains unlikely, there is real risk that the inequitable concentration of power in the hands of the five permanent members, the P5, of the Security Council will continue to threaten its perceived legitimacy. Indeed, it's powerless when a P5 member explicitly contravenes the United Nations Charter, then exercises the veto to protect itself, as Russia proceeded to do after invading Ukraine. As Anjali Dayal explains, the permanent member's willingness to block multilateral action on crises in Syria, Myanmar, Israel and Palestine has prolonged human suffering and reinforced the Security Council's enduring reputation as a mere forum for great power interests. Well, following President Biden's appearance at the United Nations General Assembly in September last year, his administration advanced six key proposals to reinforce responsible behavior of Security Council members and thereby improve the legitimacy of the United Nations. Addressing the legitimacy crisis is imperative since there is no substitute multilateral venue for global coordination on critical questions of international peace and security, writes Anjali Dayal. And because the United States has unique ability to buttress multilateralism, even without formal charter amendments. But addressing the same session of the United Nations General Assembly, however, China's Vice President Han Sheng offered a contrary view of the role of multilateralism, stressing that China will never practice hegemony and reiterating his opposition to the use of human rights and democracy as a political tool to interfere in other countries. But ever since Xi Jinping announced the Global Development Initiative in 2021, China appears to be harnessing the multilateral fluidity of UN membership unequivocally to its own advantage. And together with the Global Security Initiative and the Global Civilization Initiative, I quote, it represents China's boldest move yet to enlist the support of the Global South and to amplify Beijing's voice and build up China's profile in the United Nations. As Xu Chenggang of Stanford University observes, I quote, developing countries with authoritarian regimes, particularly those in conflict with the United States and other democracies, are finding China's new order is beneficial to their domestic rule and foreign policy. Indeed, some commentators warn that China will attempt, I quote, to harness these relationships in United Nations votes or debates to support and underline just how well accepted China's positions are within the United Nations system. A cursory glance at China's reciprocal global interests appears to implicate as many as 70 member states, just over a third of total United Nations membership, which have joined the group of Friends of the Global Development Initiative established by Xi Jinping in 2020. At least 20 countries joining the group are also debtor states of the Belt and Road Initiative. As the research center A Data revealed last year, I quote, between 2013 and 2020, each of them voted with China on at least 75% of occasions 
at the United Nations General Assembly. Bradley Parks, director of A-Data, explains that when countries vote with China at the General Assembly, they are richly rewarded. And research published recently by Axel Dreher in his book Banking on Beijing confirms, I quote, a 10% increase in voting alignment with China at the General Assembly yields a 276% increase in aid and credit from Beijing. There is no doubt that China has been able to leverage the votes of supplicant member states and swat away criticism of its egregious human rights record. In October 2022, in the defiance of an excoriating report by the United Nations Office of the High Commission for Human Rights on the Treatment of Muslim Minorities in Xinjiang, a majority of member countries represented on the United Nations Human Rights Council at a subsequent debate voted to exonerate China. It was only the second time in 16 years that such an emotion has been lost. And following this hollow victory, China enlisted 66 countries to support a statement praising its human rights record. Dennis Francis, United Nations President of the 78th Session of the General Assembly, chose his words carefully when he said in June last year that the world stands, I quote, at a crossroads in history where the membership ought to prioritize the rebuilding of trust and reigniting meaningful global solidarity. But it's not clear that this ambition will be realized soon. And perhaps we need to remind ourselves instead of the inimitable words of Doug Hammarskjöld, Secretary General, who died in an unexplained aircraft accident in 1961, who said, the United Nations was not designed to take us to heaven, but to prevent us from going to hell. Well, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much for deciding to join us today. And if you have any questions or points you'd like to raise, please pass them to the panel through the chair. Thank you, Lord Charles Bruce, for that. The UN is to prevent us from going to hell, which I guess it has done up to a point uh, for the past nearly 80 years, but not Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, Iraq, Syria, if if you were a citizen or in those places. And China's lobbying of the General Assembly, is that hegemony or is that how democracy works everywhere? That is what we are going to be discussing and what we are finding out and opening our debate. We are lucky to have with us Richard Kaplan, Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford and a specialist in UN peacekeeping. And his latest of many books is Measuring Peace, Principles, Practices, and politics. His argument is that we should manage expectations on what the UN can achieve, but exactly what are they? Richard Kaplan, give us your thoughts. Humphrey, thank you very much for inviting me onto this very interesting panel. I want to make three points. Um, first, I, I don't want to minimize at all the significance of the crisis of, of legitimacy that the UN is currently experiencing. But I think it's important to be mindful of the inherent structural limitations of the United Nations. By design, the United Nations relies for its effectiveness on the willingness and the cooperation of its member states. And this is especially true of the five permanent members of the Security Council who are uniquely granted the power by the UN Charter to veto measures that may be proposed in response to threats to the peace or breaches of the peace. Now, sometimes that cooperation has been forthcoming when authorizing military force in response to Iraq's um, aggression uh, against Kuwait in 1990, for instance, or when imposing sanctions on North Korea in 2006 in reaction to North Korea's nuclear weapons program, or when establishing the no-fly zone over Libya in 2011 to protect civilians who were caught up in that civil war. But more recently, that cooperation has been lacking in reaction to the Syrian civil war, 
um, in reaction to Russia's aggression um, against Ukraine, its invasion and annexation of territories theirs, and to Israel's war in Gaza, just to mention a few very obvious examples. And this was not was what was expected when the UN was established in 1945, but it was a very different world then when it was thought that cooperation among the allies in the Second World War could be sustained and the nature of security threats were very different to what they are today. So that's my first point. My second point is that there is some scope within the organization for bypassing or mitigating Security Council deadlock short of the overhaul, which uh, we was referred to in the introduction, uh, revision of the, the, the charter. The Uniting for Peace resolution, for instance, adopted by the UN General Assembly in the context of the Korean War in 1950, gives the General Assembly the authority to act in cases where the security fails to act as required to maintain international peace and security. The Uniting for Peace resolution has been invoked 13 times, most recently in February 2022, which led the General Assembly subsequently to adopt by sizable majorities, and that's important, several resolutions condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of its territory. Uniting for Peace has its own limitations because the General Assembly can only recommend actions to UN members, but, but when an overwhelming majority of the General Assembly condemns a country's actions, as it did in this most recent instance, it helps to isolate the country and weaken its standing within the international community. Another instrument that the UN can re, uh, use to retain its relevance, uh, which has been very rarely used, is Article 99 of the UN Charter, which gives the UN Secretary General exceptional authority to bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter which in his or her opinion may threaten the maintenance of international peace and security. The current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, invoked Article 99 on December 8th for the first time in his seven-year tenure and for the first time since 1971 in order to underscore the gravity of the threat to international peace posed by the Gaza crisis. Now, again, one can ask what difference does it make? In this case, it prompted the United Arab Emirates to submit a draft resolution to the UN Security Council calling for a humanitarian ceasefire to be adopted urgently. Of course, the resolution wasn't adopted due to a veto cast by the US, but despite being blocked by a permanent member, the text garnered support from 13 council members, including three permanent members, China, France, and Russia, with another permanent member, the UK, abstaining. Now, another more recent innovation is the General Assembly's adoption of a resolution in April 2022 that requires the President of the General Assembly to convene the Assembly each time a permanent member casts, permanent member of the Security Council casts a veto and to conduct a debate in the General Assembly on the situation in question. The aim of the resolution is to hold the five permanent Security Council members accountable for their use of the veto. Now, while this doesn't eliminate the veto, this provision subjects veto-wielding countries to a little more scrutiny than they've had to endure in the past. Now, what these examples demonstrate is that there is some scope for institutional innovation that may, and I, I say may, help to strengthen the effectiveness of the United Nations in dealing with the challenges of violent conflict in the current context. But to return to my first point, at the end of the day, the United Nations can only be as effective as member states will allow it. Now, what I, while I do favor expansion of the UN Security Council to make it more representative, I don't think that expansion, which remains a pipe dream, will necessarily make the UN more effective with respect to conflict management. Divisions will continue to prevail and impede UN effectiveness. Um, and uh, what really will be required, I think, is a change of national leadership in some cases, as did occur when, for instance, um, Gorbachev, and then, Gorbachev and then Yeltsin uh, came to power. But that's obviously not something that the United Nations can or should orchestrate. However, we mustn't think either that it's only the lack of consensus which prevents the UN from engaging more effectively in conflict management. It wasn't a lack of consensus that made Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, Mali, such intractable conflicts. 
the conflict landscape itself has become a much more hostile environment for the UN in recent decades. There are more rebel groups active in most um, civil wars today. Um, these rebel groups are also more globally connected, making it harder to suppress them. New technologies, the web, drones have also enabled a wider range of action to become influential players in violent conflict. The challenges which the UN is facing have only become more challenging in many respects. Now, my third and final point is that there are actually many things which the UN does and does well that are relevant to maintaining international peace and security, which are, which are sort of under the radar. I'll mention two in particular, conflict prevention, and conflict mediation. You won't see headlines announcing that the UN prevents the outbreak of war in country X or, or country Y, uh, because conflict prevention doesn't make headlines. It's a non-event. But in a number of conflict-affected or conflict-prone regions over the years, the UN's played an important role in damping down conflict, thus preventing it from erupting into full-scale war. The preventive deployment of UN peacekeepers, for instance, may have helped keep former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia at peace for many years, but you didn't hear a lot about that operation at the time. Now, similarly, UN conflict mediation, the peaceful mediation of disputes, often entails quiet, behind-the-scenes efforts over months, even years, to bring about a resolution of a conflict, as it did in Namibia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mozambique, and Colombia, among many other places, rarely on its own, but not without contributing significantly to processes leading to peaceful settlements. So if I can summarize what I'm saying in one sentence, um, I do think, as you said from the outset, Humphrey, that it is important to manage expectations of what the UN can achieve, but without necessarily lowering those expectations. Anyway, I'll leave it for that at that for now. Uh, Richard Kaplan, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, just to encapsulate, uh, the, the UN, in your view, has huge relevance in today's uh, today's global affairs. But also when people talk about reform, the, the thing I quoted at the beginning about reforming the charter, are you indicating that it doesn't need, you can do things on the sidelines, like the General Assembly veto debate and um, and what the Secretary General did on December the 8th, which wasn't widely reported on the Gaza crisis. And with that, you can retain the relevance and in a way modernize it? So I won't overstate the relevance of the, the UN. As I said, I do think that its relevance has in many respects diminished. It's not playing as effective a role in the international scene as it was after the um, Cold War, the, 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 the heyday really. But um, to pick up on your point about reform, it's so very difficult for the reasons that you pointed out the degree of consensus, the degree of support that's required among member states, among national legislatures, makes it almost impossible. And so I think that unless we want to uh, create a new world organization, and I don't think that we'll get uh, very far in doing that, I think that we, it, uh, we're not limited by the innovations, the kind of interventions that I mentioned, but I think that they can help. I think that member states have sometimes been very creative in their efforts to introduce innovations that do make the UN more relevant. And 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 just finally, b b before before we move on to the next panelist, um, last week I think it was there was a, a, a United Nations Security Council resolution against the attacks by the Hutu Houthi rebels uh, from Yemen in the in the Red Sea against international shipping. Is this significant? This seems because they are supported by Iran, which is an ally of Russia and China. So was this the authoritarian and the Western democracies coming together for some cause? I mean, they abstained. Russia and China abstained. They didn't veto. That is right. And I do think that it demonstrates that uh, member states, despite the many divisions that we've been talking about, are capable of coming together and uh, uniting in support of uh, common goals of uh, recognition of the really fundamental principles that underpin uh, the United Nations and arguably underpin international order. Thank you. So, so 
trade comes above ideology or something in that thing. I'll say thank you very much. Uh, uh, stay with us. We have many more questions coming in. Our second panelist, uh, Joel Ung, is with the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore, where he is deputy head of the Center for Multilateralism Studies. He began his career, cut his teeth on working on conflict and refugee issues in Uganda. His body of research includes looking at regionalism and security, and his latest book is called Contesting Sovereignty, Power and Practice in Africa and Southeast Asia. He will explain how the UN Security Council can function amid increasing power rivalry, and what this means for smaller states. Joel Ung, give us your argument. Hi, Humphrey. Thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. Um, I've already learned quite a bit uh, uh, listening to Lord Bruce and uh, Professor Richard Kaplan. Now, I'm going to expand a little bit on uh, or, or give my reading of what what is going on um, um, in regards to the context that uh, Lord Bruce had laid out to us uh, about the changes and challenges going on in the UN system. And I'll lay it out in my argument in three points. Um, first, that I, in my view, I, the world is being restructured into a more power-based system. Uh, the second point that this unequal, uh, growing inequality in, in, in a hierarchical structure is going to lead to a more conflict-ridden world. And this, uh, if we want to avoid conflict, um, gives us the uh, impetus to work m ever more um, towards a multilateral rules-based system, which ha must have the UN at its core. So, um, so first of all, um, the, the world is, in my reading, is being restructured into a more power-based system. And you might ask, well, hasn't it always been thus? But the UN, when it was formed in 1945, um, did a remarkable thing, which was to um, instill to, um, institute uh, putative equality between states with the UN General Assembly, where each member gets a uh, single vote, regardless of size. And so the narrative or rhetoric around equality uh, between nation states um, set the world on certainly not a perfect um, path, but a uh, much better one than uh, had previously preceded it. And this e e equality um, was also uh, followed up through economic development that the world's, uh, the great inequalities between the so-called developed world and developing world began to shrink. And um, this uh, allowed for the, the rising or, or growth of new power centers around the world. Now, despite the narrative of equality, uh, there was of course reservations to this equality, such as of course in the UN Security Council, um, but uh, these were largely uh, left um, alone because uh, the the leading liberal architects of, of this order uh, were committed or appeared to be committed to a more equal or flatter world. Now, this started to change in 2008 with the global financial crisis. Uh, the liberal international order since that time has been weakening and new structures that have tried to come up alongside um, perhaps to replace it or perhaps to provide alternatives have been increasingly power-based. Now, if you look, for example, at the recent expansion of BRICS, uh, they're trying to get a critical mass of rising powers uh, to provide an alternative system or challenge to the West. Uh, they, they didn't pick power, powers based on any, anything other than uh, presumably economic might and regional distribution. Okay. Now, however, um, constructing an order that's favorable to these um, rising powers, especially led by China and Russia, are, um, uh, are requires a more hierarchical system if it's to be favorable to them. The reason is, of course, that uh, China and Russia are authoritarian regimes. So uh, they have created democracy. Uh, sorry, they have created do um, structures that mi mirror or are similar to their domestic political system. So how democracies constructed a liberal international order in the past, uh, they, they, they created it uh, based on, uh, I guess, myths of equality uh, that uh, allowed states to have that one vote, one, um, one state, one vote in the UN General Assembly. But for countries such as China and Russia, who, do, who have never subscribed to this um, system of 
as such, they desire an order that implies their supremacy, drawing, of, again, from the context of their domestic political systems. Now, they, they can't uh, turn over 80 years of um, rhetoric around e equality overnight, but if you look at the way that they're creating new structures, they're creating structures that put them at the center. Um, one of these um, things that we observe in Asia uh, quite significantly is Sinocentric multilateralism, where China is at the center of all of these new networks um, that it's creating, uh, not just in Asia, of course, but also in Africa and so on, and using the Belt and Road Initiative to put place itself in this um, uh, center of this network and position themselves as first among equals. But this hierarchical system uh, that they are creating is implicit, uh, not, not clear uh, yet how how it's uh, going to function, but it's a world where uh, the powerful have larger sway and the narrative or rhetoric of equality between nation states has been diminished. Now, the problem with this um, hierarchical system uh, is not that so much that the, that, um, the international order has, uh, must be flat, but rather that in determining uh, differences of power, you need conflict to resolve just exactly who is more powerful than whom. It's this sort of world in which uh, the, the contests have to play out periodically that has created an ever increasing set of conflicts in, in the last two or three years, actually since we've come out of COVID in general. Now, for, from my perspective, I come from Singapore, we're a small state. And from our perspective as a small state, we think that we are in big trouble in such a <clears throat> hierarchical um, system. This is, uh, therefore, um, uh, gives us the need to restore the rules-based system. Now, as I said, that has been under um, assault since the global financial crisis, where the inequalities of the old system uh, led to uh, 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 d disillusionment with it, and therefore uh, fewer and fewer states or actors were willing to sustain it, uh, leading to the, the current uh, system where more and more states are creating alternatives, rivals, but which are, are implicitly hierarchical rather than egalitarian. Now, the UN is the only system uh, the, uh, of international law that enjoys universal consensus among nation states. So therefore, international law based on the United Nations um, conventions has to be the basis of it. Uh, it's in relevance Ironically, as uh, as um, the others on this panel talk about the conflicts and the UN being unable to um, intervene uh, effectively on, uh, to, uh, on this uh, is actually, in my view, greater than ever because we need that rules-based system that the, only the UN can provide more than ever. Now, there's a sl silver lining, I think, which is that small states who are most threatened by the changing and more hierarchical system that's being developed have the strongest impetus to restore that rules-based order. But they're not the only ones. Middle powers, um, uh, even aspiring powers, uh, will hopefully appreciate the logic that uh, a power-based system is eventually going to trample on them. Uh, it's going to be more conflict-laden. It's going to be more difficult to uh, sustain the kind of um, global security that allows trade and growth um, that we've had in the last 50 years. And uh, this should or hopefully will create a more a greater critical mass that is not only made up of small states who need that rules-based order, but also greater and larger states who understand the um, principle of this logic. So while um, in, in some, while the liberal international order has with all its flaws, um, led to upheavals that have created a more, uh, or, or created um, alternatives or rival structures that are now threatening it, uh, the UN still maintains its uh, role as the most important uh, center for new reform in the uh, international system. And so in that, that in my view, uh, its relevance has never been um, less as we, uh, sadly, um, witness a more conflict within the world. Thank you.
Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. And uh, more relevant in a way, I, I guess, because of, of, of this discussion we're having. Uh, just a, a couple of quick questions. The, the issue that came up about the way China is handling the, the UN General Assembly, uh, and is it is it a new style of hegemony or is it the way de democratic politics work anywhere in the world with the lobbying and the deals and the barter and all the rest of it? Yeah, I, I don't think that is actually all that unusual. Um, I think what happens, though, I, or my reading of it is that China is most effective at doing this when it has a small, uh, I guess, uh, elite to deal with. And that these are particularly authoritarian states. Now, when the when the leaders are democratically elected, um, their 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 source of influence um, is much broader. Or, or no, sorry, so their their um, source of legitimacy is much broader. They need the pu public to support them, so they can't cut backroom deals with China as easily. Well, now when they're dictators, uh, <laughs> it's a lot easier for them to <laughs> decide what uh, they're going to do uh, without consultation anywhere else. So and China does have it easier in that regard. Yeah, and, and, and another, another quick question is: is the the bones of contention, as it were, is what constitutes a war crime is coming up at the moment? What is a human rights abuse? Whether you're talking about Xinjiang genocide, all that sort of stuff, it. Are these all UN issues, and does the charter have to be changed to change those definitions? Uh, I think so. The, I, I don't think the definitions are in any trouble. Um, what what happens, I guess, is uh, or or where the grievances have been uh, driven have, have been the sort of in, um, uh, inconsistent application of these allegations, right? So. Uh, why does Israel get away with it, um, whereas China gets criticized? That that would be the, the Chinese uh, uh, defense, right? Yeah. Or, or uh, point out the uh, hypocrisy of the West in some version of it. Now, uh, th what it really means, and it co goes back to my point about restoring a rules-based system, is that we just have to be more consistent about this. We, we have to really put down our uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, biases that, that uh, allow us to overlook certain friends who are doing the same things that uh, our enemies also do and make sure that we consistently try to call both sides up. Okay, that's uh, th that's great. Thank you for clarifying that. We are moving on to our next panelist, Alina Lyon, Professor of Political Science at the University of New Hampshire and Editor-in-Chief of the Global Governance Journal. Among her Books are U.S. Politics in the United Nations and the United Nations in the 21st Century. So we are right on the ticket for our debate here. And she's going to put for us the U.N. relevance into a broader perspective, touching on the reform, peacekeeping operations. Alina Lyon, tell us what you know. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about both the history and the notion of relevance. Um, and so... The idea that the question about retaining relevance of the United Nations in particular, that is an endure, that is an endemic question. It is a question that came up in the 1960s with the Vietnam War. It was a question that came up in the 1980s, definitely in the 2000s, particularly around the U.S. war in Iraq, um, whether or not the U.N. was relevant and whether or not the Security Council could uphold the rules uh, of international uh, prevention. It also was something that came up um, after the Arab Spring and Syria and its use of chemical weapons. So this discussion is something I think that we need to put in historical context. It seems to happen over and over again. Um, the other thing that I'll say in terms of relevance, I would argue that the United Nations has never been more relevant than it is today. And when we are thinking about relevance, we're not only thinking about international peace and security, which is what the charter mandates it do, right? To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Again, and as many have talked about, we see war in Ukraine, in Gaza, Yemen. I mean, just in the last few uh, hours, we have a situation with Iran and Pakistan, and I mean, all, all many places in Sub-Saharan Africa, the list is long. So in addition to this particular mandate, save succeeding generations from the 
scourge of war, we also have this huge laundry list of things like climate change, immigration issues, poverty, uh, hunger, and people all over the world. So when I think about the UN and its relevance, I'm going to invite your audience to think about two United Nations, right? So there is one United Nations, which is the 193 countries or member states. And that first UN, there is a, the UN provides a, an arena, really, for the competition. And it, as uh, many have said before me, right now it's an arena for great power competition, right? So there is a power struggle between uh, Russia and China and the United States. And many are talking about a bipolar system or a tripolar system. We can also talk a little bit about the rise of the global south. But that arena, you know, whether or not it's a soccer field or, you know, I'm, I'm just north of Boston and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Red Sox. When the baseball team, the Red Sox, lose, we don't blame Fenway Park, which is its arena, right? Um, and so we're, we're at a time, a very interesting and, and dangerous time where great power politics rages. And the UN, especially the Security Council, becomes the arena for that particular uh, fight and for those particular debates. And in terms of needing a venue for diplomacy, a table where countries can come together and have those conversations, potentially to find an off-ramp out of war, out of violence, that table needs to be there. That arena needs to be there. And so the UN provides an incredible uh, venue for that. It is the only place where you have 193 member states, almost all of the countries in the world, having an opportunity to come together and do that. The other thing when we think about this first UN um, is that the, the, the constellation of who is representing those great powers right now is really problematic. So we think of who's in control of Russia with Vladimir Putin. He has blatantly disregarded international law, especially one of the foundational elements, which is sovereignty. You do not invade other countries. You do not use military force for uh, conflict resolution, right? That has been, you know, and so for the last 23 months, that direct target at the foundation of, of a rule about sovereignty, and there are many other rules that come down at, but you see a blatant disregard on the part of one of the founding members of the UN who was actually supposed to sit there and protect international peace and security. Um, we can also talk about China and its expansionist, and we just spent a bit of time talking about that. In addition, the United States, which often serves a leadership role in the UN system and in the Security Council, has been incredibly fickle, mixed messages, you know, the, under the Trump administration and other presidents prior, the, the UN was was declared as irrelevant as a as a talk shop, as something that's not necessarily. So the the United States, which really is a core partner in increasing UN legitimacy, has been um, uh, fickle at the best, right? And so that's a highly problematic element. In addition, um, you know, the dynamics within Security Council are one that. You see um, many, many countries watching, but there have been things that have been tinkering, right? But we do need this council. And I, we can talk a little bit more about reform in just a second. The other piece about relevance is what I would argue is the expectations gap. The world expects the United Nations to fix all the wars, to fix the poverty, to fix climate change, right? This incredible uh, buffet of challenges that the UN is supposed to address. And it's given very, very little resources. So now let me talk a little bit about the second United Nations. So the second United Nations is the bureaucracy. It is 40,000 UN employees and 86,000 UN peacekeepers that are all over the globe doing the work of uh, famine relief, building refugee camps, uh, providing um, vaccines, polio vaccines, <laughs> eliminating small, smallpox, making sure that the mail internationally is delivered, making sure that there's rules concerning how you can use the oceans and uh, and what you can put in them and what you, how you can fish. The list is really, so just to drill down in terms of what the UN is doing and its relevance, those kind of less politicized, although many of them are these days, elements of its work are absolutely essential. And actually, you know, we if and the, the cliche is if the UN, if we destroyed the UN or if we dismantled it, we would need to build it the very next day uh, and to rebuild it. And, and the politics at the global level are terrible for that type of rebuilding at this moment. So we have this 80-year-old mechanism that is both an arena for great power politics and a place 
um, where uh, uh, you know 120,000 people do the work of trying to govern the globe is going on at the same time. The other thing in terms of expectations, so we have these very high expectations, I have to point out that the UN is woefully ill-equipped, both in terms of the rules that it has and has been pointed out, it doesn't have the capacity to check the power of the great powers. There's nothing in its charter, there were, and that was deliberate, right? But it's, it wasn't set up structurally to be able to hold Russia accountable or great powers accountable if they're violating the rules. The second thing, and I'm just going to bring your attention to funding. So the United Nations runs at about <clears throat> a little over $10 billion. That's its annual operating fund if you include the general budget and the peacekeeping budget. <clears throat> Just for context, the budget, the operating budget of the city of London is about $20 billion. So it's almost double that of the entire UN system. So it's woefully underfunded and has very little tools to hold international uh, great powers accountable. So when we have this kind of dynamic, it does make it very thin in terms of its capacities to deal with this very, very challenging element. Now, in terms of reform and whether it can reform, the UN over the last 80 years has done a ton of what I will call tinkering. First of all, peacekeeping didn't exist in the UN Charter. It has created peacekeeping. It has created the United Nations Environmental Program. It has created many, many agencies, and it has reformed some agencies along the way. So we know it has capacity to do that. Dramatic reforms, no. Tinkering to adjust to the climate, it, yes. But it is slow, and many, many are very frustrated with that. Um, I will say one other thing um, in terms of <clears throat> um, funding and, and building consensus. The United Nations, many people are pointing out that in order for the United Nations to continue being relevant, it has to be more inclusive, right? Inclusive of small countries, uh, of lesser powerful countries. It has to be something that allows many, many people to sit at the table. And there is work being done for that. And in fact, this September, September of 2024, the UN is convening what's called the Summit for the Future. And it has an agenda. And on that list is sustainable development and creating something like a Sustainable Development Commission or Council. It's also thinking about international peace and security. And this is where the discussions of UN Security Council reform come in. It also is talking about an international artificial intelligence agency to help the international community deal with that particular challenge. So the just to kind of sum up, the UN is incredibly relevant when we think about its relevance, both in terms of an arena for member states uh, and great power competition, that has to stay in, something like that has to stay in place. That table needs to be there. Uh, but we also invite you to think about all the other work that the UN is doing with very little resources and very little capacity. So, I mean, many will say, this is not the time to break the table, right? We need the table uh, to help international relations continue. Uh, thank you. That was uh, that was incredibly interesting. Now, we will not break the table, but can I put to you, uh, uh, I'll wrap up two questions that have come in fr from the audience. I'll give you them both and wrap them into a single thought. Is the UN, this is from Navid Wahid, is the UN really equipped to deal with multiple global conflicts, especially when one of its priorities is to balance its neutrality in the face of differences between member states? And Ritesh, Niam says, what role might the UN play going forward in helping to quell US-China tensions, avoid a new Cold War, and foster a more cordial relationship between the two? Can you give us your thoughts on those two? Yeah, so the first one in terms of neutrality, I think neutrality is actually essential. And when we look whether or not it's peacekeeping or mediation, you need and go to go back to, you know, the either this the the football field or or the the um the, ba the baseball field, you need a neutral arbitrator, right? We need a referee. We need an umpire, an umpire, excuse me. We need someone who can help call the shots um, and actually point out. So one of the things that's actually the UN is doing as a neutral uh, in Ukraine is actually documentation, right? It is the, the, the organization that is documenting human rights abuses and potentially mass atrocities, potentially genocide, right? It's someone who has that credibility to come in and do that. It's an incredibly important role. But again, it is challenging, but the credibility, the legitimacy, the capacity of the UN has to maintain that neutrality. And, and it's actually debatable whether it's neutral many times. That gets highly 
politicized, but I think especially it's it's very it's 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 absolutely essential. And in fact, in terms of peacekeeping, there are that many that say that UN peacekeeping has gone too far when it has when it engages in what we call robust peacekeeping, where it actually is armed and has authorization to pursue combatants. Some say, wait a minute, we've gone too far. The UN needs to maintain maintain that neutrality. In terms of U.S.-China tensions, um, you know, I'm not a China expert, but I do know that China has a stake in global stability, right? It is making money. It has benefited from the UN system, from the international liberal order, from the rules-based order that the previous uh, speaker talked about. It's benefited from that. It does not want to blow this up. So in terms of creating international stability, that particular goal is a place where the UN can bring the US in, can bring China in and other powerful actors and say, this is the table where we can find places of consensus and build opportunities for working together, decreasing in, you know, uh, cons- decreasing insecurities between countries and increasing trust building. There's, there's an incredible amount of back office diplomacy that goes on in those UN corridors, isn't there, about stuff that we never hear about. We only hear about, uh, or we hear about Taiwan and the South China Sea, but the all the other things in which the US, China and other countries work together on. I just want to, before I let you go, pick you up on or, or question you about Joel Ung's point on consistency, because you were talking about the human rights element there, which has a sort of different different definition in China's mind than it has in the U.S. mind. And also about the, uh, I've often heard this, the unprecedented uh, invasion of a sovereign power by a U.N. permanent member, but the U.S. didn't they invade Panama and Grenada without t- mentioning it to a soul? So c- could you t- talk about that a bit? Well, I think there's two things in that question I think are really interesting. The first one is consistency. And yes, the United Nation, the United States in particular, I mean, you can also point to Iraq in 2003, right? I've done quite a bit of research on that particular one. It, it was non, uh, not a UN authorized invasion, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and many people argue that it broke the UN, right? That it was because it was the United States and the UK and some of its allies that did that. So yes, consistency is absolutely important. And, and I think as we, the farther we get away from that, the thinner the capacity for the UN is. And so bringing that back in is, is going to be an incredible chore of the UN. The second thing I think that I want to point out that's really interesting here is concepts. Things like the UN is really an innovator. So when we think about human rights, that's a UN innovation in many ways. Genocide, a UN innovation. Uh, sustainability, protection of civilians. The list is really, really long. So there are all these things that the UN is doing to work towards our understanding of the world. They are they remain contested. We haven't agreed. We don't have that consensus, but the table is set for those who want to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to our final panelists now. There are other questions in, so I will we will feed those in. Um, after we have heard from Maya Unga, UN Project Officer of the International Crisis Group, which is a global independent organization that advises how to prevent conflict. Our panelists' job is to monitor the UN Security Council, which, as we've been hearing, is facing an unprecedented barrage of challenges at the moment, not least its inability uh, to reform and update itself and how to tinker at the edges. She will be giving her bird's eye view on those reform issues and the increased voice of the Global South. Maya Unga, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning from a snowy New York. Um, thank you so much for having me on today. At its core, the United Nations is an organization dictated by the desires and the needs of member states. This means that, in my opinion, the UN is only as relevant as states allow it to be. The UN has faced a number of shocks to the system in the past few years, from COVID to Ukraine to Gaza, right? And these all challenge the legitimacy and the relevancy of the institution itself. There are a number of runoff effects from this which can lessen the power of the UN, from less trust in the traditional tools like UN peacekeeping operations to real challenges in funding the stark humanitarian appeals we see around the world. However, these shocks to both the global community as well as the relevance of the United Nations more broadly have also caused a sense of renewed momentum for reform as member states recognize an opening in the political space. In the past, powerful states have really dominated the conversation in New York. And while this is often still the case, we're increasingly seeing a push from other countries, particularly those in the so-called global south, to change this balance of power. 
So while part of this push is a genuine desire for a better and a more relevant UN, it's also a strategic move, right, from a number of states who have felt you know, chronically underrepresented in New York. They see an opportunity for movement on a number of issues that they've long championed. These shocks, particularly the globalized world wars like in Ukraine and like Gaza, have created a situation in which more powerful states are actually bidding for the votes of smaller ones, in some cases at the UN. For example, as the US looked to increase vote numbers on Ukraine resolutions in the General Assembly, they turned to African member states. And many of these kind of informal conversations, the backdoor corridors that I just mentioned, ended up resulting in a sense of quid pro quo, you know, in return for a vote on Ukraine. Maybe there's an expectation that the topic of UN financing for AU peace operations should be taken more seriously. So this is an example of how middle and smaller power states are able to strategically use the attention of powerful players to push their priorities at the United Nations, thereby also increasing the organization's relevance. However, the increased vocalness of middle and smaller states can also diminish the UN's relevance, as their increasing frustration with the system results in them strengthening other forms of multilateral cooperation. BRICS, for example, agreed in August of 2023 to add six new members to its bloc. So that means that they now represent a whopping 42% of the global population and 36% of its GDP. And if the prominence of BRICS continues to rise, some might say that the legitimacy of the UN as the prime international body could lessen, right? However, even within these forums, the UN's presence is still felt. So um, in the outcome document from the 2023 BRICS summit, for the very first time, uh, China and Russia backed the statement to explicitly include support for Brazil, for India, for South Africa, and their quote unquote ambitions to join the Security Council. Now, member states have not been the only ones to recognize the need for a reconsideration of the role of the United Nations at this moment. As Alina mentioned earlier, the Secretary General decided to convene what he's calling a summit for the future in September of this year. And this recognizes the wide spate of new and emerging challenges faced by the international community and a lack of real agreement on how to deal with them. On the issues of international peace and security in particular, the SG's new agenda for peace conveys a sense of urgency in revitalizing the UN's tools to make a more effective and a more relevant UN. And this new agenda was one of 11 policy briefs that the SG put out um, ahead of you know, member states' decisions in relation to the summit of the future. The title of the new agenda for peace is actually an allusion to the original agenda for peace published in 1992 and that took into account the new world order in the aftermath of the cold war you know recommending a new vision for the role of the united nations within that recognizing another inflection point right now in the world order this new agenda aims to be similarly forward-looking but it differs in the fact that it's focusing on prompting member states into action and positioning the united nations instead of more in a supporting role it's important to not be naive about the feasibility of member states' abilities to agree on reform proposals. In the eventual Pact of the Future, which is this summit outcome document that we're expected to be agreed upon by UN membership in September, almost all of the suggestions in the new agenda, for example, will be watered down if they're even incorporated at all. However, the push to have them in the first place shows a recognition from the very highest levels of the UN system about a need for change. And it is a positive sign that this institution will continue to push to evolve itself in a way that will hopefully maintain its relevance. These member states' debates about a new role of the United Nations, one which is more relevant and more prepared to face the world's challenges, are currently ongoing. As always, the topic of Security Council reform is top of mind for many diplomats, many of us in the panel today. And as the SG himself noted in the new agenda, there is a need, quote, for urgent progress in the intergovernmental negotiations on the reform of the Security Council, end quote. However, the SG's unwillingness to actually endorse any particular proposals is really indicative of the feasibility of these discussions. Despite reform being a central component of the summit of the future, any serious reform to the Security Council's membership, its veto structure, is highly unlikely to be happening in September. In lieu of that, smaller yet still substantive reforms merit discussion and could lead to a more democratic and a more relevant UN, from reform of the penholder system within the Council to increasing the advisory potential of the Peacebuilding Commission. Another key example of this centers around the role of the General Assembly, which was alluded to earlier. 
The council is obviously the primary actor when we talk about the maintenance of international peace and security, but when the council's gridlocked, the GA does have a number of tools under its belt, such as those that are outlined by Chapter 4 of the UN Charter, as well as the 1950 Uniting for Peace Resolution, which Richard already mentioned in his earlier remarks. These are rarely used, but a number of member states have recently been pushing to open up the political space for this to change. For example, the 2023 um, re Revitalization Bill of the General Assembly, which was passed in September of this past year, requested the creation of a digital handbook, which would outline past practices and recommendations for the GA's engagement in this area. This essentially would be a how-to guide as well as you know, a history wrapped up into one that would work to build institutional memory and really grease the wheels of this toolbox. Similar innovative ideas of reform which strengthen the underutilized but already existing mechanisms of the UN system are important in order to increase the UN's effectiveness, its legitimacy, as well as its relevance in the international order. You know, the good news is that the fact that there are copious conversations about the topic of reform itself does mean that states continue to see a utility in the UN system. The bad news, though, is that the less hopeful that the members of the Global South are about the possibility of real reform, the possibility of their grievances actually being met in a substantial way, the less trust and solidarity they're going to be putting into the organization. So all this to say, do I believe the UN is still relevant? Yes. Will it continue to be so in the future? Yes, but only if it proves itself capable of evolution and adaptation in line with what member states demand of it. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to put to you two questions that come in from the audience. Um, one from Anand Singh Toma. Uh, do the panel, do you agree that it would be beneficial for regional blocs to be given membership of the UN instead of having new individual state members? And wrapped up in that, um, Raj Patel says, is civil society important in keeping the UN relevant? Uh, give us your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Um, so to get to the first question about whether or not it would be beneficial for regional blocks um, to have a membership instead of individual states, I think that um, in order to answer this question, it's important to look at the role that individual states play on the council. So when you think about a particular member of the Security Council, like an African member state, for example, right now, their priority first and foremost is going to be to the national interests of their state. Secondarily, it's going to be to, you know, the interests of maybe their sub-regional organization, then maybe the interest of the African Union, and then the interests of the UN membership more broadly. And um, because of that, I understand the desire to want to have a membership block who maybe is able to think in these broader terms instead of focusing on national state interests. However, the reality of the situation is that um, that would be adding another very complicated layer to an already complicated council, right? So if, for example, the African member states beforehand have to agree on a common position before coming to the council, it's going to make it a lot harder for us to see any meaningful work being done. That's not to say it isn't already happening in some contexts. Oftentimes, for example, the African member states do follow a common AU position, the AU Peace and Security Council, is voting and putting forth these types of position documents, which are then put onto the Security Council's, um, the Security Council's, uh, the comments that these member states make there. But I do think that it would further complicate the situation if we saw a regional type of representation. Okay. And, and civil society, that I, I, I that question I, I imagine is more at the grassroots when you're working with UNDP or UNHCR or something like that. But, but give us your thoughts on its importance to the UN. Yeah, I think civil society is critical to the UN in a number of ways. Um, first, civil society is very important in continuing to push and hold the United Nations accountable, right? You see this in the way that civil society meets regularly with member states, they re meet regularly with the UN system and let them know that someone is listening to them, not just back in Capitol, but here in New York, in Geneva, you know, in Rome, in these various, uh, in Nairobi, in these various capitals of the UN system, 
um, there is a sense of accountability that civil society is able to bring. Additionally, civil society, such as my organization, the International Crisis Group, plays can play a really important role in helping to inform member states in the United Nations from a different perspective. We don't suffer from some of the same bureaucratic or political struggles that member states or the UN system does, and therefore we're able to provide nuanced and independent information to help to better inform the decisions that they make. So I think civil society is really critical. And and just in, in on a technical point, I, you were talking about these regional bodies. The African Union uh, was talking a lot about intervening in Niger coup, I think, in, over the past few months. If it did that, would that then have automatic international legitimacy or would that have to go through a UN Security Council resolution? So um, in in terms of the kind of legitimacy, right, of something like an intervention from the AU, I think when we're talking about um, about that area, it's important to also have as much as possible backing from the broader international community, which would mean backing from the UN Security Council. What we've seen recently is that African member states, when they put something forth at the council, tend to get, if it's about their own you know, countries, it's a, if it's about their own continent, they tend to get broader support. And so um, you're likely to see whether a statement, whether a resolution, some sort of support from the council itself, if the AU is making a concrete decision. Okay, that's uh, thank you, thank you for that. I, I just wanted to clarify that in, in my mind on where that international legitimacy is. I'd like to go around the panel with a couple of issues uh, before we we go um, uh, go on from there. Uh, Richard, Richard Kaplan, can we come back to you? I want to nail down a little bit on this issue of consistency that Joel Ung uh, brought out. The inconsistency of say invading uh, Panama or Grenada and then damning Russia for invading Ukraine, the definition of a human rights abuse, uh, the whole argument uh, from the authoritarian bloc, from China in particular, is that all these elements are weighted towards Western democracies and not towards their way of thinking. Uh, could give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, I don't think that, I think this is a real issue, certainly. I don't think that it is specific to the United Nations. This is a, a question that plays out in all uh, arenas. Um, and it's it's really... And the UN is a sort of arbiter, isn't it, of, of, well, of these issues or meant to be or not? Not only, because uh, there, there are other fora where uh, human rights, um, uh, where... Um, um, many of these, these, these questions are discussed. It's not limited to the United Nations, but there is sensitivity. And, and I think it's useful what uh, Alina um, introduced earlier about these two United Nations. Mm -hmm. It is important to differentiate between what actions member states take at the UN or, 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 on, uh, or globally and what the UN itself does. Because I think that the UN itself, the bureaucracy, the organization is l less subject to that kind of criticism uh, about um, inconsistency. Now, of course, the UN uh, does uh, what it does at the bidding of the, the member states. It's either uh, funded to do some things and funded sufficiently or not sufficiently to do some things or, or not funded to do some things. And so in that sense, a, uh, responding to crises, for instance, uh, why doesn't the UN go to country X when it went to country Y? Well, that's not always the fact of the United Nations. The Secretary General hasn't made that decision, uh, or the, the 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 Secretariat that it will not engage in. Uh, but it will often be that member states don't have an appetite for dealing with a particular crisis, and so yes, the UN right. itself is limited in in what it can do. But I think that these kinds of uh, debates, the, the 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 accusations and so forth, they play out in all international arena, arenas that are concerned with these issues, and as I said, not limited just to uh, the United Nations. And there, the, could, could, could the UN? So, sorry, could the UN take a lead then in in narrowing these inconsistencies? Well, I mean, it does in some respects. It weighs in, I'd say, on because of the breadth of issues that it engages with, it does certainly weigh in on, on these things. But I mean, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, 
uh, the, uh, the, the, there are a lot of, I mean, these are the, the, These are all will. part of the, 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 of the post-Second World War big idea, yeah, aren't Britain they? Was, they're, they're yeah. all of that thinking. And, of and they're the affiliated to the UN, but the UN, yeah. they, have, they have their own competences and they often will take uh, the lead on matters of trade, on monetary uh, matters. And so the, you know, a lot of the issues of, of consistency, inconsistency, um, play out in other uh, arena that have, I'd say, primary responsibility, although the UN um, has a, a, a finger in every issue you can imagine on the, yeah. on I, the on I, I think in, in, in the sort of public's view is that if something goes wrong with the world, what's the UN doing about it? <laughs> and the, the other organizations, some of them are with the UN and some are, but, but thank you very much for that. We, I have a, a question that I'll take to Joe Lung to begin with, but, but everybody can chip in on, does the UN need to pursue a new approach to climate change and environmental issues since it is often thwarted by its need for universal consensus. We're going on to the environment and, and climate change now. Um, Jo Long, your thoughts? Uh, so the, the environmental challenge uh, at the UN is uh, something that I think small island states feel very acutely. And one of the good things about the UN uh, is the one state, one vote in this particular instance uh, over represents the small island states, as it were. Uh, in other words, they're very powerful at the General Assembly in caucusing around this issue. So um, if there is a problem, it's not with this, the UN structure. I, I think the problem is, is very much with the large states who will have to bear the cost of adjustment um, to climate transitions uh, or climate friendly transitions. Uh, and uh, th this comes back down, actually, in my view, to the domestic um, uh, pressures that these um, larger states will face. So I, I don't think, uh, I, I mean, yes, the UN is a mess and and, and these, these negotiations tend to capture headlines for the wrong reasons, but the underlying dynamics is not really because of the UN. It's really because of, uh, in my view, the... the I, I, it, it's interesting in, in, in your, your answer to that and, and, and Richard Kaplan's answer earlier sort of saying that, that consistency in climate change for two issues and not just the UN. I'm wondering to what extent that is making the UN more irrelevant or not. Uh, uh, Alina Lyon, consistency in climate change and your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. So I would go back to my original conception of kind of the first UN as the arena for member states and then the second UN and for what it's doing. And so I'll start with the second UN, right? So the second UN has created organizations like the United Nations Environmental Program, the Conference of Parties, which is an annual meeting in which countries get together and try to, one, set goals and two, set targets in terms of reduction of climate change, the idea of net zero, all of these things have come out of those UN meetings. Now, if we go to the first UN um, and the member states, the member states, you know, as Joel just said, they're really the problem here, including my own, the United States that is in of a Paris and out of Paris and we can't afford this. And so the fickleness or the lack of capacity to commit to this goal global ambition, right? The, the climate changes is, is, a, is a tragic and wonderful example all at the same time because it echo, it kind of really puts a spotlight on how interdependent the globe is at this moment, right? Not one, not a block, not the African countries, not the European countries, not the Asian countries can deal with this alone, right? This is this really integrated interdependent issue in which all countries really need to contribute. And so you one, you have to get consensus. What is the goal? The UN has been very good at helping that consensus right now, 1.5 degrees Celsius, net zero, there are all these targets. But the real challenge is trying to, at the domestic level, getting countries to engage in this. And I think, you know, again, the UN it has this capacity, but it's so slow. And I'm not quite sure on that particular one, we have have the time for member states to come on board to make the real commitments that are necessary. Uh, thank you. And just I have to ask you very quickly, um, because uh, Donald Trump keeps saying he's going to pull out of NATO and everything else. Will Donald Trump pull the US out of the out of the UN? Well, so I'm sitting in New Hampshire. Donald Trump is, if not here, he will be here very soon because we are the first in the nation yeah. primary. And so that is something that is very uh, much on our minds. Donald Trump actually, I think, likes the UN as a forum for him to be Donald Trump. 
in terms of the agencies and institutions that second UN, it took enormous hit during his first presidency. So for example, he withdrew all funding from UNRWA, right? Which is that uh, UN organization that's working in Gaza. Yeah. There were many, many organizations that he gutted. And so I think in terms of the first UN, he loves it. In terms of the second UN, I have concerns, but if there is a little bit of a silver lining, some of the research I've done has shown that Congress likes the UN. They're the one that actually writes the check. And so even in really, really high pressure times, the president will offer his budget. And there are many times when Republican controlled Congresses still write the check. Okay, that's it. That is a, that, that is a very useful. Thank you for that. I'm going to give a last question, go around the panel, beginning with Maya Unga now on Prashant Kumar's uh, question, are we heading toward World War III? And I'm going to add, what can the UN do to stop it? Maya Unga? Thank you. A really easy question to <laughs> end on. And, and, um, and, 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 and a very short answer. Give us a, a, a 10 second answer. <laughs> are we heading towards World War III? I think that we are heading towards a state of increased international disarray. If that ends up in World War III, I don't know, and I hope not, but I do think that the UN can play an important role in helping to you know, keep open channels of communication. There's very few places in the world where Russia and where China and the US and France and the UK can sit in a room together and they can discuss issues in a diplomatic way. And so I think more than anything else, the maintenance of the United Nations as a channel of communication as an important provider of humanitarian aid and as so many of the other critical things um, that it does for the people, as well as the states of the international okay. community, maintains its relevance. So, so that 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 keeps it uh, highly relevant. Uh, Richard Kaplan, are we heading towards World War Three, and what can well, the UN do? I'm not going to speculate about the future. I certainly hope not. And I will echo Maya in saying that there is very definitely a role to, for the UN to play in preventing a uh, slide towards um, uh, uh, World War Three. I think that as uh, an arena for uh, for dialogue, for uh, addressing the the problems that lead to the eruption of of conflict, uh, in so many ways, I think that the UN has a role to play to dampen down uh, the 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 tensions. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm I'm not going to try to. I think it's very unlikely. I think that uh, the the parties are mindful of what's at stake. Uh, and I think that that is an inhibiting factor, a very strong inhibiting that, that, factor. That, 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 that is, that is uh, uplifting. Uh, Joel Nung, Ung, are we uh, heading towards World War Three, And what can the UN do? Yeah. So, so the good news is uh, we don't have the tight alliance structures of the pre-World War periods, uh, which make it less likely. But is superpower conflict possible in this period? I think very possible. Uh, and so what we need to do is impress upon the superpowers that what makes them great isn't their power, but how they manage the regional the regional security around them. And if they do that responsibly, they should be dampening um, conflict rather than uh, instigating it. And the UN is relevant in that. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Alina Lyon, uh, give us your final thought before we go to Barry Gardner. Um, well... As a scholar of international relations, there are a lot of things that are in place that are very concerning. I will just say that. I am not one that sleeps well at night when I think about this particular question. And oftentimes we've seen, for example, with previous wars where people stumble into wars. Um, but the UN is an incredible resource for countries if they want to find ways to come out. One of the things that, and again, I talked about the situation with Pakistan and Iran this morning, China is very engaged in that one. So the great powers for the most part, China and the United States in particular, have a very strategic interest on many levels for not allowing that to happen. And that's a good news. Well, that, that is good news too. Uh, Peter Cornish, who is tuning in, says, fascinating debate. Looking forward to hear from Barry Gardner, and it's time to bring in our Democracy Forum chair, who has been listening throughout, despite uh, my worries at the beginning, and is now going to give us his view on how successful we've been in honing in on the key issues. Barry, over to you. Humphrey, thank you, and, and thank you to all our panelists for, for a really fascinating debate. I, I've really enjoyed it. Um, the first thing I should say is my apologies. Um, if a bell goes off in the background, I will have to leave you immediately and go and vote. Um, and we've been warned that it could happen any time. 
uh, this is uh, interesting because the, the, the UK at the moment, the UK Parliament is currently about to vote on uh, its asylum and immigration bill. Uh, and it's actually voting on whether we believe that Rwanda is a safe place to return or to rather send uh, those people who come in a, in a form, a, a mode of transport that our government deems illegal, uh, namely small boats across the channel. Um, so with that in the background, um, our current Secretary of Defense has recently uh, given a speech in which he says that the world is in a state of pre-war. Uh, that goes, I think, Humphrey, to your last question about uh, uh, where we're headed. Um, but I wanted to, to pick up and try and summarize. Lord Charles Bruce, uh, as always, gave us a, a wonderful introduction. He, he talked about the, the crisis of legitimacy um, that lack of consensus amongst the P5 leading to a paralysis of the UN Security Council, um, the way in which it inadequately reflects the, the current balance of, of power and indeed the representation of, of emerging economies. Um, he, he quoted Biden's six points or actually referred to them. Uh, he quoted China when, when they'd said they'll, they'll never practice hegemony. And he spoke of the way in which authoritarian regimes that are uh, mainly opposed to, to US policy are increasingly accepting China's leadership in, global, in the Global Development Initiative. Um, he, he used the, the allegation that's been made that uh, this is quite lucrative for those, those countries and, and, and states that did, um, and, and finished up uh, reminding us that Doug Hammarskjöld uh, did limit our expectations um, of, of the ability of the UN when he said not to take us to heaven, but to prevent us from going to hell. Um, now, Richard Kaplan took up that theme of managing expectations. He reminded us of the inherent structural limitations that exist. Um, the UN depends on member states cooperating. Um, he, he spoke of areas in which they had, in Korea, in Libya, um, but of course also pointed out that when it came to areas like Syria, Ukraine, Gaza, uh, there was an alternate history there too. Um, his second point was uh, around there being some scope for bypassing the Security Council, um, uh, the Uniting for Peace resolution. <coughs> he said the Council has influence, um, and Article 99 that, that the Secretary General invoked uh, in December over Gaza, um, which precipitated the UAE motion. Um, and that adoption of a resolution saying there should be a debate in the council whenever a P5 member exercises the veto. Um, so he said that he didn't believe that the expansion of the P5, I, I think I'm right in saying he, he didn't believe it would either happen or help, but I, I wasn't quite sure I'd, I'd, I'd caught that uh, when he said it. Um, and then his third point, the things that the UN does well. Um, he pointed to conflict resolution, he pointed to conflict mediation, and it's important to manage our expectations, I think, without uh, undermining them. Um, we, we still, uh, I think his, his message would be, have faith. Um, Joling, if we want to avoid conflict, we need a multilateral rules-based system in an increasingly power-based world. Um, he spoke of in the 1990s, there were significant changes to recognize uh, one member, one uh, vote in, in a flatter world structure. Um, but this, he said, was inimical to, to the, the authoritarian powers of China and Russia, uh, and they're creating new structures, he pointed out, uh, like Belt and Road, uh, where the powerful are at the center of those structures, and it's very much a, an imbalanced system. Um, but he said a power-based system, I thought this is a very interesting observation, a power-based system requires resolution as to who is more powerful. And that resolution is conflict. That resolution comes about, it manifests itself in the form of wars and conflict. Um, he also mentioned that middle powers should understand the dangers of, of great powers trampling on them. Uh, and he said relevance in, in, in that it is needed, but not in its capacity to resolve problems. 
Um, and I think it, it, I, I found it interesting that we 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 framed this debate around the UN's continued relevance, um, but we never defined relevance. Uh, and and it, it's a, a, an elusive word. Um, sometimes it can be necessary, sometimes it can be engaged, sometimes it can be useful, sometimes it can mean adequate. Um, you know, there you are slipping into uh, the quicksand, um, chest deep, uh, but there's a stick. Well, the stick is certainly relevant. Um, it's possibly necessary, um, but it may not be adequate. Uh, and I think the discussion at various points um, used the word relevant in, in, in those different changing forms. How useful to have Elissa Lyon come in and say, look, there are two UNs that we're talking about here. Um, you know, relevance has a history, she said, uh, saving succeeding generations from the scourge of war, the P5 Security Council, is just one part of the job of the United Nations. And she spoke about climate change. She spoke about, um, I, I loved her analogy, uh, as someone who once lived in Boston, um, uh, you know, uh, the Red Sox lose, we don't blame Fenway Park. Um, the UN as an arena, the UN as a table, a recurring theme again of the discussion. But she pointed out the other part of the UN is the UN Convention on Desertification, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UN Convention on Biodiversity, the UNCTAD, UNHCR, UNIDO, UNEP. This is the UN. And and in a sense, if, if I were to, to, to pick a, a, a tiny thread uh, away from what uh, uh, Alyssa was saying, I would say this is not two UNs, it absolutely is one UN, because these are the bodies of the UN that are all going to help make our world more secure, that are trying to tackle injustice, that are trying to tackle famine, that are trying to tackle underdevelopment, that are trying to tackle climate change. Um, and, and so I, I think really we have to understand the UN not simply as the headline P5 Security Council, but it, the, as this, uh, as uh, I think again, it was Alyssa that pointed out, uh, this tiny organization with a budget half the size of Greater London um, that actually is, is tasked with bringing all these strands of global insecurity together uh, and trying to give us the framework to build a, a more secure world. Um, she talked about it being ill-equipped and, uh, and, and that was a point I thought very well taken, uh, having no capacity to hold great powers to account and being chronically underfunded. Um, now, she raised the, the, the whole issue of the, the UN summit uh, for the future. Um, and of course, here we, we come on to my own gar. It was, it was the International Crisis Group article, I think, 10 challenges for the UN in, in 23, 24, uh, that, was, that precipitated a lot of this debate. Very helpful, I think. Um, uh, they noted Guterres's work on the summit uh, of the future um, and and they sort of set out uh, the way in which the summit was going to accelerate efforts to meet our existing international commitments and take concrete steps to respond to emerging challenges and opportunities. I think that's a direct quote from from the way the the, the summit put it. And the scope of the summit has has five separate chapters: sustainable development and financing, um, international peace and security science, technology, and innovation, digital cooperation, uh, youth and future generations, and transforming global governance. And, you know, this is, this shows that this is not simply about conflict at that high primary level. This is diving deep to understand the structural reasons that conflict comes about, uh, and then trying to grapple with them. Um, I, I liked her phrase of an inflection point in the world order. And, and I, I do think that is, is really accurate. Um, 
so much in the world order is changing. That, that's why there are these arguments about, uh, about the, the membership of the P5 and so on, and whether or not it's uh, going to be changed. So many people in the world feel that it is just, it's no longer adequate in the way, it, both in its membership and in, and in the way in which it is permitted to function. Um, uh, depressing that she said all suggestions will be watered down um, and that reform of the Security Council is unlikely, but, but no doubt that's a very realistic assessment from somebody who is looking at this as, as, as her day job. Um, uh, the General Assembly has tools that are rarely used, she said, the creation of a digital handbook. Uh, uh, and finished up, I, I think, with, with something that we can take to be hopeful. Uh, and that is, it has to be, the, the UN has to be capable of evolution and adaptation. Um, the UN has, ha, has created so many avenues for humanity to exercise common sense. And it keeps on having to exercise or create more avenues because we get halfway up one and we don't exercise common sense. The power element of the, 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 the powerful state breaks down that cooperation and that common sense. And it doesn't mean that we should deny the progress that we've made whether that's in terms of famine relief, uh, whether that's in terms of climate change, whether it's in terms of the sustainable development goal. Um, but we must constantly do what Maya said, and that is try and seek to help this organization evolve and adapt if we are actually to see common sense break out in the world. Thank you. Adna, thank you very much for that. Your knowledge and your passion shone through, I have to say there. Uh, Time's winged chariot is upon us. Uh, a fascinating debate. Thank you, our Democracy Forum panelists, Richard Kaplan, Joel Ung, Alina J. Lyon, and Maya Unger, for giving us such a, a detailed and incisive discussion. And I think we had a, a conclusion of the relevancy, although we didn't define it of course, and to Lord Charles Bruce for setting up our debate. Uh, thank you all for your questions and comments in the audience. And do look at our sister magazine, uh, Asian Affairs, which goes into these topics in, in great detail and depth in regions and issues that, that are rarely discussed in the mainstream press. Um, until next time, uh, from all of us at the Democracy Forum and Asian Affairs, thanks for joining us and goodbye. Thank you.